Hi there and welcome. Jonathan here. These talks are offered freely so that no one is ever denied access to these practices. Your support makes a big difference. If you feel inspired to make a donation, please go to jonathanfaust.com. Thank you. Sorry about bashing my mic into the podium. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that was passive aggressive. It reminds me once I was, I was um, co-leading a retreat and uh, it was the, the morning set, so it must have been 545 and uh, two of us were leading up front and um, the other person was leading the meditation and the microphone was on a boom mic like this you know and so she was you know leading this meditation the entire room was dark and then suddenly there was this sound and everyone jumped and I looked over and her head went like this <laughs> she tried to make it look like a religious experience but it didn't <laughs> It did, didn't work. This is a great line I heard a while ago where someone said, I missed my yoga practice this morning. That makes it uh, six years. Uh, Gary Marshall died. Uh, Gary Marshall was one of the most successful writer, producer, directors uh, in, in recent years. Um, he produced Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy, The Odd Couple, lots of really famous movies. And I was listening to uh, an, an interview from like 1990 uh, on NPR. He was talking about when he started out and... Um, he was a musician, so he would write jokes for musicians during their sets. And he, uh, he, wrote, he wrote these jokes for a musician he knew uh, on a single sheet of paper. And uh, he handed the sheet to the musician, and he read, he read it. And then he took out his cigarette lighter, and he, and he burned the paper, and then you know, told him to leave the room. He said it was his first flaming rejection. But but he said later, he thought, he said, you know what? I think he kind of smiled at that third joke. Let me rewrite it. And I thought, what a pivotal moment in, in his life. And that's a little bit of what I'd like to talk about. Like, w there's some spark that, that you have that calls you to do something. Either it's, it might be a delusion, but there's some sense of something that you want to create. And that's really what drives us forward. There's, there's, the wheels turn on desire. We've talked a lot in the past about the power of intention, but I'd also like to talk about the power of focus. We all get frustrated at times that we can't get more done or we can't stay focused on what we know is good for us. And I, I have learned over the years that, that very few people need advice on what diet would be best or what exercise would be best. We know what that is and what the missing piece is doing it and, and how, to, how to stay inspired while we're, while we're doing something. So I'd like to talk about, as I often do, in, in four pieces. First, uh, the power of focus you know, what you can create out of focus. A little bit on how and why you lose focus. And to talk about how when you're focused on something, it sets you up for some transformational arc. There's some growth that lies when you can stay focused. And then finally, to talk about some strategies, some practical things that can be helpful for, for keeping attention on what you want to keep attention on. So 
probably the most classic and archetypal story I could run across about the power of focus. It draws on the experience of the Buddha and Buddhist psychology. You may know that the early part of his life was very kind of indulged and very protected, and then something in him called him to practice. It was the experience of the four heavenly messengers, you know, seeing someone sick, seeing someone old, seeing someone who had died. And then the fourth was meeting a renunciate, meeting a spiritual practitioner who was arduously examining what life is all about. And that called him forward because he wanted to know what is it that's beyond death? What is it that's beyond sickness and old age? In truth, he really wanted to know what is reality? What is fundamentally real about this this human experience? That was his journey. And that journey took him all, all kinds of places. He he started off doing very extreme practices of very, very um, austere practices of self-denial. He realized they were providing him transcendent insights, but not liberation. And that articulated a different way of practicing, the articulation of the middle way of not too tight, not too loose, but cultivating balance. And he went on to refine his practice as he was practicing. And according to the story of the Buddha, he finally resolved to to fully awaken. And before his awakening, he was visited by Mara, or illusion. And in that final, final showdown, was really Mara just saying, who do you think you are? Who do you take yourself to be? And he quite famously touched the earth and said, you know, to, to witness what I have done in my life, that opened him to see into the nature of reality. So he was tested by everything you can imagine. And that showdown with Mara was, it's a pretty fantastical story. You know, he sent armies and then he sent his beautiful daughters to seduce him. Then he, he tried everything in the world, testing his resolve and his focus. In that same way, you, your resolve and your focus is being tested all the time. In the midst of what you want, you are buffeted by all kinds of, all kinds of winds. And there are beautiful teachings of the, of the, uh, the eight worldly winds, a desire for, for fame and wealth and success and the fear of failure, the fear of humiliation fear of losing, that we're, we're so caught and driven by these. And yet I would, I would imagine that for you, there have been times in your life where you were very, very focused on what you wanted and you were able to sustain focus and some goal, whatever that was, you know, the, the, the degree, the job, the, whatever success you've created in your life is a direct result of your capacity to to focus in the midst of distractions. In meditation, we learn how to focus. And one of the classic analogies that we often use and for people who are just starting off in meditation is what it's like to train a puppy how to sit. If you've ever done that, you say sit. The puppy has no idea what you're talking about. So you push your little bottom to the floor and you say sit. And the puppy looks at you adoringly and runs off. You can train the puppy by whacking it if it moves. You'll never get a happy puppy that way. But you understand that's what puppy does. That's what a puppy does. So with, with persistence and patience, a puppy will actually learn how to sit. In that same way, when you practice meditation, the mind wanders. There you go again. Come on back. Over time your mind will begin to sit. It will begin to stay for, for longer and longer periods of time. And, of course, the benefits of that have been proven really beyond a doubt. Its effect on your physiology, your emotional equilibrium, your mental clarity, your intuition, 
everything gets enhanced from your capacity to be present. And there's a real rush that comes out of being focused. You know, there's immense pleasure that can come out of, out of concentration practices. So in that same way, as you develop focus and concentration in your meditation practice, you find yourself more calm. You'll find yourself not quite as quickly thrown off center by a strong emotion or a strong mental formation. Something comes at you and you find, hey, I, I kind of bounce back pretty quickly. That, that resilience arises from from that capacity of focus. At the same time, this is not an easy practice. Stephen Levine famously said that meditation is one insult after another. And when you sit for any period of time, you just see how shameless the mind is, how almost impossible the mind is to control. However, it's a mind training technique. And sometimes we may not even be aware of the benefit from just pausing. As one of my teachers said, it's not even, the benefit of meditating is not even so much about what you get in the moment, it's about the trouble you didn't get into by sitting still. It's something to consider. <clears throat> So the more you settle, the more clear you get. The more clear you get, the more you get a sense of, of what you want. And yet, at the same time, every one of us at times gets frustrated because we want certain things and we can't sustain our focus. We lose our focus. We get distracted. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how that happens. I have the good fortune to work with uh, a number of uh, CEOs here in the D.C. area. And there is one, one person who, who shared how his entire professional focus was to become the head of this large organization. Um, extremely well-trained, extremely intelligent, very, very focused. And he had been at this company in a real position of a lot of power and a lot of responsibility, but it was the, kind of the number two job, not the number one job. And there were times when he got passed up, but was told, you know, hang in there, it's going to happen. And he was, I think, enjoying the kind of the power and influence and authority that he had, but there was this sense of something missing. That, that job would be a lot more satisfying. And so he started very, uh, with a very sincere and intense attitude to really look through this lens of non-judging awareness at, at his desire for this job, his frustration around it. And he had a big realization one day. He realized he really didn't want that job. He saw that it was, it was a political job. It was filled with all kinds of booby traps. Everyone who did that job before him got completely chewed up and spit out. No one had ever succeeded at that job before. And suddenly, there is a bit of a, a little disequilibrium because his entire focus had been on that job. So the question then was, well, what, well, what do I really want? And that opened up a lots of new possibilities. And what I've noticed is that for many people, we're, we're conflicted about what we want. I was talking with someone recently who was saying that, that they really want to be in a long-term committed relationship, but they really like their personal time. And they're not really sure they could stand having someone sharing a house with four walls. And someone else a little while ago was saying they really wanted to go on this, on this really, really cool vacation, but they really weren't sure they wanted to spend the money. And someone else who said, I really want to, I really want to open my heart and, and forgive. 
you know, those who've wronged me in my life, but I'm not sure I'm ready to really look at that Pandora's box of all my conditioning around relationships. Whenever we have an internal conflict about what we want, there's something inside that wants it, and there's something inside that's not so sure. And depending on which one has the microphone, that's where our attention goes. Someone said, we're, we're actually run by committee. You know, these different voices that just pass the microphone around, which can get pretty confusing at times. So it's very important to ask yourself, what is it that you really, really want? And whatever it is that you really want, to recognize that there's a cost to that. There's a certain price that you, you have to pay when you really want something. If you want to take a dive into a long-term committed relationship, then you're going to be letting go of a certain amount of autonomy in your life that you've been used to. If you want to go on a vacation, you're going to have to not do other things because your money is going in that direction. And if you want to explore forgiveness, then you're going to be opening up some old wounds. And you're going to have to be willing to stay in the ring of going through that whole deconstruction process. So the question really is, what do you really, really want? With a secondary question, and what are you willing to give up to get it? So when you find yourself caught in conflict around unable to sustain focus on something, it's really helpful to ask yourself, what is it that you're really, really wanting? There are a few interesting elements around this. And that is that when you lose focus, you can begin to really look at what are the patterns that occur around losing focus. On a meditation retreat, where you have the opportunity to be in silence for a week and just to practice walking and sitting and self-observation, lots, lots of things happen. You begin to really notice the, the repetitive thoughts. You, know, you, you, can, you begin to notice your, your top ten you know, the top ten stories that keep coming through. But you also begin to notice how your mind will so kind of predictably go off in different directions. And oftentimes what we'll do is when someone will say, like, I get, so, I get so lost in anger, like suddenly I'm just angry and I don't know why. And oftentimes we'll just point out and say, did you notice what were the thoughts you were having before you went off in that direction? because we were trying to slow down that, that arising of sensation and the arising of reactive patterns. So there was someone who was working on a, on a creative project. They were trying to do some writing. And they'd have an idea, a really cool idea that they, they thought maybe this would be the way to go. And I think, yeah, that's what I should do. But then they noticed that they would always end up with a very particular sexual fantasy. Like, why am I thinking this? They'd always end up with this fantasy. Every time. So we were trying to kind of break this down a little bit. So, so what's happening? So here's an idea. I should really do this. And then there'd be some, like, hazy, murky, unconscious experience. And then, and then he'd wake up in this very particular repetitive sexual fantasy. 
what happens most of the time in our life, if we don't pay attention, is we react. Most of our life is just reacting, and we're not aware of the mechanism of how we react. So slowing it down can be very helpful. And kind of what we noticed in sort of deconstructing this, that that he'd have a new idea of what he was going to write about. He'd get excited. And then he'd get a little bit attached to what that was going to look like. Like, oh, this is going to be great. And then he'd get really uncomfortable. And that place of discomfort is where we try to slow things down a little bit. And he began to recognize that 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 discomfort has some quality of fear about it and and some kind of confusion. And the, 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 the sort of the confusion felt kind of dark inside. And he realized that the the fear was a fear of failure. Like I can't do this. So here was an idea, a really, really good idea. I should really do this. And when he slowed it down, I don't think I can do this. I'm going to fail. I'll go off into a fantasy and distract myself. So the fantasy had more to do around that trigger of fear of failure. Have you noticed the ways that you get hijacked when you're working on something and suddenly you find yourself going somewhere else. Someone told me, she would, she would always think like, you know, I should do some yoga. Why am I eating? <laughs> like, what, how do you get from there to there? I tend to see this as how there, there are certain tendencies that we have. And when we, when we look through the lens of the five classical um, obstacles to mindfulness, you know how some people are, are outraged waiting to happen? You know, they're just hair trigger. They're ready to anger, judgment, blame, ready to fly off at anything. In that same way, for this person who would go off into fantasy, it's a very classical pattern. The five patterns of where we go when things aren't going our way, we go into anger, judgment, blame, or we'll go off into fantasy or planning, or we get lost in anxiety and worry, or we sort of lose energy and go into a depressive state, or we get paralyzed by doubt or self-criticism. And we tend toward one. Mind, Mind tends to go toward fantasy and planning. And it's so dangerous for me to have my browser open when I'm trying to write a Dharma talk. You know, I should research that. And suddenly I'm comparing whatever I'm comparing. Isn't it amazing when you wake up on some spontaneous internet search? Like, how did I end up here? It's crazy. So what happens is... You're going along... Things are kind of in homeostasis. Let's say you're focusing on something you said you wanted to get done. And then you hit a snag, and there's some tightening inside. The tightening is is either something's wrong with me or something's wrong out there. And And then the tension begins to build, and we experience it as a wave. The tension gets more and more uncomfortable... And the way to get off the, off the discomfort of that wave is either you fly off into anger, judgment, blame, blame something, or disconnect and disassociate into a fantasy or some mental state, some planning, or you'll fly off into an endless loop of worry or anxiety, or you lose energy. You ever had that experience where you really focus and like, I'm exhausted. <laughs> You just like some just pulls the plug. Or you'll get lost in doubt. I can't do this. This is stupid. Why don't I even start? Recognizing those five states can be so helpful. And recognizing that that it's the discomfort, that moment of where you disconnect and go into reactive pattern. That's the place to work. 
that's the place to look. Oh, this is a fear of failure. Oh, this is a feeling of loneliness, whatever it may be. That's the key to, to waking up. So it might be helpful to do a short reflection, if you like. You can close your eyes. We'll do a little, little two-minute reflection here. You might bring into mind just some place of focus in your life, something that you're working on, that you're having difficulty staying with, just to take a few minutes to kind of go through the files. Some project that you, you wish you were a little further down the way. And I'd like to offer just a few questions to help you tease this out a little bit. And when you reflect on this, this project or whatever it may be, what does it feel like inside as you think about it? And what is your way of avoiding moving further on it? Do you find yourself caught in anger or disassociation, planning, fantasy? Do you get caught in worry? Do you lose energy? Does it kick off that paralysis of doubt or self-judgment? And if you were to stay with that discomfort in moving through it, what would you have to feel? Is there an emotional word that you can find that resonates with that feeling? And can you offer this a little bit of empathy or compassion? And as you do so, how does it move or shift or change? Is there a sense of what you would need to, to stay with this, to work with this in a different way? What kind of support would you need? And if you had that, what would that be like? What would that feel like? And then deepening your breath. You can let your eyes open. I hope that short reflection was helpful and didn't inflict too much psychic damage. But it can really be helpful to look, just to pause and look at that stuck place and to really sense, so what is this all about? And what does this need? Because there's always an unmet need in there somewhere. So when you focus on something... The Buddha quite famously said how when you, when you want to be more awake in life, you're swimming upstream. And he said this 2,500 years ago. He said it's not just your own conditioning, but you're swimming against the entire culture. Because the culture is not interested in slowing down and paying attention. It's usually about speeding up and getting more. So there have been lots of studies out there on, on what... What determines success? And one strong determination of success, it's not intelligence. It's not connections. It's uh, referred to as grit. That's the number one determination of success, is the capacity to sustain attention on a goal, to stay with it.
So I wanted to share with you a few strategies that, that might be helpful. When you have a sense of where you want to go, when, you're, when your intention is clear, this is where I want to go, it's really helpful to have a map. Because the map is going to show you where not to go. And if you go, if you go that way, you're going to fall off a cliff. You know, if you go that way, you're going to get lost in a cave. So to really look ahead at the map can be very, very helpful. So in terms of spiritual practice, in terms of really looking at, so if my goal is to be, is to, is to be more awake, to be more aware, to open up the, the infinite capacity of my heart, there's a map that's outlined in through Buddhist psychology and Buddhist philosophy of the Eightfold Path that the first two speak of wisdom, cultivating wisdom, which is having an overview and, and clarifying your intention. Then there are elements that talk about ethics. You know, when it comes to speech and action and livelihood, here are things to be aware of, here are things to avoid. And then the last two have to do with developing skill. Here are ways you can really dial in your attention and here are really ways you can dial in your capacity to observe without judging. So we kind of have a very, very beautiful map laid out in terms of spiritual practice. In terms of skillful means in the world, there's also lots of good stuff out there. There's a lot of garbage out there, too. Um, but there is some really good stuff. And I find it interesting to look through this lens in Buddhist psychology of what are considered the refuges, where the Buddha said, where do you go when you're, when you're really lost in your life? And the three refuges are um, awareness, truth, and love. Or the Buddha, awareness. The Dharma, what is true. And Sangha, connection, community, or love. So the Buddha is to really ask yourself, well, what is it that you really want? Is what you're doing now going to lead to where you want to be 10 years from now? What are you willing to give yourself to? Very, very important question. I remember when I, I, I left one position, and I'd always been really ambitious, and I, I, I was working my way up, but I realized this isn't for me. And I let it all go, and I was ready to race up the next ladder. And something in me said, wait a minute, you're really good at climbing ladders, but is the ladder on the right wall? And so to really ask yourself that is so helpful. In terms of the Dharma, it's very helpful to reflect with, where, with whatever it, it is in your life that you want. What are the best practices like, who has gone before you and had success? What's their advice? You know, what's, what's the roadmap? Are there any models out there that can be helpful for you? And one of the most important things about staying focused with what you most want in your life really draws on this quality of sangha or community. And the first one is to find like-minded people. If you're around people who want what you want, chances are much, much higher that you'll move in that direction. I think I've told the story maybe too many times. The study they did that said if you take your, take your five best friends, average out their income, it's probably your income. And when I heard that, I thought, I need new friends. <laughs> but the truth is, we gravitate toward those we spend the most time with. So to be, really be aware with what you want in your life, if you're around people who are inspired, chances are much, much higher you're going to be inspired. Also along those lines is to find people who are, who are better than you at something. If you want to get good at tennis, find someone who's better than you 
and you'll get better. Another element that's so helpful, and again, it has to do with community and how we can draw on relationships to be inspiring, is to reflect on who, who is a model. Who's already doing what you want to be doing? Uh, neuro-linguistic programming has got this great little formula that says, find someone who has what you want, do exactly what they do, and you'll have what they have. But finding models can be very, very helpful. Another element that's very important for sustaining focus is to get feedback. To really get, to get real-time feedback on how you're doing. It's so, so helpful. It's one of the real keys for not just moving into learning, but into what's called super learning. So to get, to get real-time feedback. I wanted to, to close with just a, a few analogies. Um, there's a writer by the name of James Clear who I, who I take a lot of inspiration from. When he, he talked about um, what gets in the way of sustaining focus, and he, he talked about this very famous lion trainer by the name of Clyde Beatty, and uh, trained lions, you know, and he, he, he was very, very good at it. And he developed this system that a lot of people use where he would use a whip and a chair. And he would, and as he described it, when he would be, uh, he would work on this act where he'd have all kinds of different wild cats. And he would work with all these different species at the same time. And he said what people didn't realize that, that the real tool that he used was not the whip, it was the chair. Because when he would hold the chair in front of in front of a, an angry cat, it would see the four legs, and the four legs would confuse the cat. And that way he could sort of distract it and then sort of work with it behaviorally. And he said in that same way, when you've got four options in front of you instead of one, the mind gets confused. And one way to really focus on focus is to narrow your attention. The idea of multitasking is really proven to be a myth. We really can't do it. It really is just one thing at a time. But learning how to do one thing at a time can be a dramatic, dramatic shift for sustaining focus. I think I'd share with you before a, a technique that I use that's been very helpful for me because I, I am easily distracted, a fantasy waiting to happen. Um, and that is the uh, technique called the Pomodoro technique. Pomodoro means tomato in Italian. But the guy who created this was in, a, uh, uh, in med school in Italy, and he was really having trouble focusing, but he had this kitchen timer that looked like a little tomato, and he set it for 25 minutes, and he would just work on one thing and then take a five-minute break and then do another and uh, I have found that I've had tremendous success with that. 25 minutes of focus and take a forced break. Because sometimes you're on a roll and say, oh, I'll keep going. But then you, you kind of fracture your attention. So I wanted to offer that. That's been very, very helpful. I'm working on a, I'm working on a book. So I do one Pomodoro a day on that book. 25 minutes of total focus. And it's amazing what you can get done when you concentrate. The other story that he tells is um, a story of a, a Westerner learning archery in Japan, the Zen archery. He was so frustrated with his teacher who kept emphasizing the fundamentals and fundamentals. And, and he, said, uh, he said, are you expecting me to do this blindfold? And the, and the teacher said, come back tonight. And in pitch dark, uh, the master's master um, he shot a bullseye. He could tell by the way it hit the target. Then he shot another arrow, which split the arrow and the bullseye. And the next arrow split that arrow. And, uh, and of course, he was wowed by this. And then the master said, uh, after winning the battle, tighten your helmet. 
And really what he was saying was that when you've achieved a goal, keep going. It's not just hitting one goal and stopping. But again, it's the grit. It's the capacity to sustain attention that will make all the difference in the world. Just as when the Buddha, with that intention to wake up, had to encounter everything that was between him and feeling free, to see it clearly, to see his true nature. In that same way, with with whatever it is that you want in your life, whatever you determine that to be, calling on that capacity to, to focus and to stay focused is going to continue to move you toward that which you most want in your life. But I think one of the most powerful mantras there is in this practice is to keep going. When you're frustrated, keep going. And when you think you've arrived, definitely keep going. Why don't we close with a short reflection on this? So you might just draw your attention to your breath. And you might, in your own way, just to reflect on what is it that you are called to in this life? What do you want? And what are you willing to give up to get it? Reflecting on the possibility of being more awake to the ways that you lose your focus. And to reflect on how that which is you calling you forward is a journey of transformation. It's calling you to greater aliveness, to greater mastery. And what is it in your life that you most need, that was most support you in moving forward in your journey? And we'll close with a very short reflection on the offering of merit. Whatever well-being, whatever benefit you generate in your practice, perhaps even today, whatever you have generated, offering the fruit of your practice to yourself and to those in your inner circle and to all beings. May we all feel peace. May we all feel happiness. And may we all feel joy. And as you're ready, letting the eyes open. Thank you for your kind attention. A few quick announcements. Um, the parking scene is a little, is challenging. Just want to acknowledge that. If you can do your best to not to park in the fire lanes, uh, we're trying to support the the community here in the church as well as the the local police who are trying to make sure we're all safe. So to be aware of that. Um, the uh, day-long retreat I'm leading this weekend with Tara uh, is waitlisted, but you can always try to get on that. And I will be leading a retreat later this month on, uh, on yoga, relaxation, and meditation. It's a really, uh, it's a juicy day-long. So uh, more information on my site. You can always sign up if you want to be on the mailing list. Thank you, as always, for your support for the church and me. And uh, have a wonderful week. See you next week. Thanks.